up front if you want to come up front or move your chair or whatever. Yeah? You okay? Isabel, are you okay way over there? All right. Tell me if you can't hear me or anything. And I like being able to see everyone. Oh! So nice to have you here. Is there anybody in the room who's brand new or who hasn't been here before? Oh, good. Oh, the hands are like, <laughs> I can't see the hands because they're moving <laughs> this up. Welcome, welcome. Um, <coughs> can you scoot over a little bit so that I can see your face? And um, Janet, maybe you scoot to your right just a little bit. I'd like to be able to see everybody in the room if I can. So that, so that I feel like I'm really with all of you. All right, I just don't want my... Are we good? Are we good? We're great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right. So, <sighs> Sunday evening, beautiful day, unbelievably beautiful day, yes? What a blessing. Um, this will be my last teaching until January for all of you, which makes me a little sad. Um, but in January, I get to return as spiritual advisor to this center, which makes me very happy. <laughs> Well, of course, my better half, <laughs> as you will see, <laughs> Rick Blue, and um, I hope to continue these kinds of teachings uh, that I'm going to be doing tonight, which really concern um, our moment-to-moment -moment life, our real life, um, which exists only in the here and now. It's something that uh, Lama Marut is definitely emphasizing, I can see in his new curriculum. Part of what our problem is that we just aren't present. We aren't here. We're in Fort Lauderdale, I don't know, someplace. But really, we're in the future, inhabiting the future in some fantasy, which probably is not going to turn out the way we think or we're in a panic about things that have happened in the past, which we reify, we make our memories into facts, into hardcore things that happen to us. And we raise issues to each other about, about these things that happen to us, we gather friends around us, we create power struggles of all kinds. <coughs> but those things are gone. And the power that they hold over us is in our memory, is in our minds. And we can change our minds. And the great gospel of Buddhism, as I was saying this last week, is that everything is changing. They say three trillion times a second. We are more like a shimmering light or vibratory energy, a wave, a particle. We are a field or a, mm, a dance of potential, a song. Something that we think of as um, a stream, a moving stream. So I say this to everyone when you're discouraged, when you feel depressed, when you're certain that things are in a certain way and they never will change. That's just not true. 
they will change and they can change. And at the highest levels, we teach that everything can change. Everything. Every great religion holds out the possibility of overcoming death, of overcoming time. So, tonight I wanted to teach on two things that I think are very important <coughs> to relationship. And I'm going to do a lot of teaching, I hope, in the new year on relationship and why other people in our lives are so important. And that if we made a priority of relationship, our lives would be quite different. They would be oriented quite differently. And we might have uh, a bit more contentment in our lives if the relationships in our lives were the most important thing. So um, I have to slate for Bob. Uh, this is called slating in the movie business where I say who I am. My name is Lindsay Krauss. That always makes me laugh when I have to say my name. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm teaching tonight a class uh, of my own creation called uh, Grace and Power. Um, I just did a, a production of Driving Miss Daisy here in Gloucester. And there are many ways to interpret that play, but one of the ways that you could interpret that play is that it's a struggle between grace and power. The entire civil rights movement was a struggle between grace and power. And that's where the background of the play lies. It's a brilliant playwright who chose a love story, basically, two people. There's three in the play. One is um, an aid, like a divine aid. Mm. But these two people are struggling. And one represents grace, and one represents power. And I had not seen the movie when I did the play. And I thought that Daisy was, you know, she's the lead. She's the leading lady. I thought, here's the good guy. And then I realized halfway through, now I'm playing kind of the villain. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing the bad guy. <laughs> and it's very interesting. On stage, when you play the bad guy, you cannot play something bad. Because the theater is an arena of love. It appears to be the arena of conflict. But it's not. It's not. The conflict is created so that love can triumph. And the conflict is created so that it will look true to us. Because life without conflict doesn't appear real to any of us. So there's conflict. But when you're playing the bad guy, you have to be doing something good. You have to be doing something good. And even in our own psychology, we often understand that people who have done terrible things have done them as a way of creating order and balance in their lives. They, their lives are out of whack. Maybe they've been terribly abused. Now, they become the abuser in order to create some kind of order and balance in their lives. So sometimes we can, when we are doing something that is harmful, we can even think of ourselves. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Three is a ch Yes. <laughs> so, in this play, <coughs> Miss Daisy, uh, at the opening of the play, she's lost her husband, <coughs> and into her life walks. Hoke, this wonderful black man, as her driver because she's just cracked up her car to such a degree that her son is convinced that she cannot drive anymore. And this is just symbolic of a moment of real uh, awareness of our own mortality, these moments when we cannot be in denial much longer. We try, and we go kicking and screaming, as she did. but where we are faced with the fact that we are going to die, that we are, that our faculties are failing. So this is that moment in life, and Daisy is feisty, so she's not going to go easily. And in comes Hope, standing in her living room, where had her husband been alive, he probably never would have been her driver, offering to help her. And it's confusing to her 
because the last thing she wants is help. She thinks of herself as extremely capable. So her first sin is the sin of pride. It's pride that's involved in the desire for power. It's pride. So she has many speeches declaring how capable she is and how she's been capable since she was young. And she's always done things for herself and she doesn't need anybody's help. <laughs> I had a great, great voice coach that I worked with for 40 years. She was my spiritual guide before I found my teacher, Lama Marut. And she said to me one day when I was feeling my oats, Lindsay, calm down. The leading lady always needs help. <laughs> it was something as a 20th century girl, you know, good old girl of the 60s, it hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> but Miss Daisy needs help. And help has arrived, but with everything that hope does for her, she becomes more and more distraught that something is being taken away from her. And even though she claims to be not prejudiced at all, she's quite prejudiced. And it was very interesting to me, the form that her prejudice took. Because when you play a part, you experience a human being's experience. You experience it for them. Because that character doesn't really exist. There's only you having the experience. And I was surprised that my experience was, again and again, that any time that I did something that I needed to take responsibility for, I would blame this man. Immediately, almost unthinkingly, and quite thoroughly, get it off myself, get it onto him. He became for me a kind of totem, almost, that I could just plug myself into when I needed to download any sense of guilt or shame or upset that I had. It would be his fault. As a matter of fact, the last note that the director gave me when I was about to fly off on my own and he was not going to be there. I said, if I have any question of degree, how far to go in a scene, can you tell me what should guide me? And he said, just let him have it. Mm. Whatever it is, just let him have it. Mm. Wow. So, this, this play, very interestingly, won a Tony, it won, if I'm not mistaken, a Pulitzer Prize and the Oscar. And no play in the history of American theater has ever done that. Wow. That means to me that it struck a chord, a deep chord, in a lot of people. And to me, the chord is, let him have it. <coughs> That's the chord. That it's very, very hard for us to take responsibility for what we see in front of us as our world. We don't want to do it. It exposes us. We feel afraid. Um, we are certain in the sense of our own bodies being so solid and ending at our skin that we are vulnerable, that we need to protect ourselves, we need to lash out, we need to strike back. We need to fortify ourselves by jockeying in, you know, for position. And you know what it's like to be a jockey. You know, they're up there <coughs> in those stirrups. They've got very little hold on anything. You know, they can be unseated pretty easily and often are. Jockeying for position is um, a very brutal way to find comfort, to find any kind of steadiness in our lives, any kind of security. It's not a very secure seat. So ultimately in the play, there is a crisis where there's a dinner that Miss Daisy is going to go to, the United Jewish Appeal, which was very active in the civil rights movement, and, and Daisy's Jewish, is holding a dinner for Martin Luther King to speak at. <coughs> in fact, this dinner was held and Martin Luther King gave a speech in which he said, history will not condemn the bad guys. It will condemn the good folk who didn't do anything, who stood by, who were passive. So in that background, in that setting, he places this woman who could invite her driver 
to the dinner. She has the tickets. Her son decides not to go because he feels it might be threatening to the family business if he were seen there. He isn't necessarily against Martin Luther King or what he's doing, but he, he's, he's a realist. He sees what might happen to them all if he goes to the dinner. So she has an extra ticket. He says, why don't you invite Hoke? She says, don't be ridiculous. He wouldn't come. He says, ask him. The next scene, she's getting into the car on the way to the dinner. She's all dressed up, and clearly he's driving her in his uniform. And she tells a lie. The only one, as far as I know, that she tells in the play. And it seems very out of character. But it's very interesting, having taught acting for about 40 years now, I've discovered that every character is out of character in a drama. Because the whole point of a drama is to represent that moment in life where a chasm opens up. And you've never been there before. And what is it that you value? What is it that is ground for you to stand up on in that moment? Where do you turn? What is worthwhile to you? Because you're going to grab at something to help you across. So the chasm opens when, as they're getting closer and closer to the theater, and she's told this lie that her son told her that Hope wanted to go to the dinner. But in fact, in her opinion, because he's black, he's probably been to see Martin Luther King many times. It turns out that's not true. Part of her limited vision that all black people were sitting in the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And she points out to him, well, you know, you could go anytime you want. So finally, he says, you know, what are you doing? What's up with you? And she says, well, my son said that you wanted to go. Is that true? He says, no. She said, well, I didn't think so. But, you know, you could hear Martin Luther King any time. And he turns to her and he says, you got this invitation a month ago. If you wanted to invite me, why didn't you invite me properly? Like a human being. Why didn't you ask me to accompany you to this dinner? And it cuts her to the quick. It cuts her down. She can't, she can't blame him for that. There's nobody to blame. And she's caught. And the next scene that she has on stage, she's losing her mind. She's actually starting to lose her mind. And I really struggled <coughs> with this section of the play because I just couldn't memorize the lines. And when you can't memorize lines, it's because you don't understand what's happening. You don't understand what that person's doing. Because when you understand what someone's doing, then the words that they're saying make sense. Our words don't have any meaning unless we're purposeful in what we're doing with them. We use words to cover. This is what Pinter discovered. When you have long silences in a play, people are naked, they're revealed. When they're constantly talking, they have a chance to parry and faint and appear to be doing something that they're not actually doing. So I couldn't memorize these lines. Bobby was running the lines with me day after day, and I was like, he'll tell you, I was so frustrated. I, and every time I couldn't remember one, I'd go, well, I don't understand this. What is she doing? And finally, it occurred to me that she couldn't forgive herself. That every definition that she had of herself as a good human being, mm. unprejudiced, you know, a good human being had fallen apart around her ears. The only thing she can construct, she starts talking about a time in her life long ago when she was a teacher. She taught fifth grade, and she's looking for the papers that she corrected. That's a time in her life where she, th she remembers being a good human being, where things were in order. And she can't reach out to him either. She can't bear 
even being with him, being in his presence. It's unbearable. And she becomes more and more hysterical. And as she does so, he becomes stronger and stronger and stronger because he's standing for the human being underneath all of that. He knows who she really is. And he's holding her soul in his hand. And he will not let it go. He will not let her go down. And there's a moment, and the playwright's so terrific because he never has to refer to any of this. See, we never say what we mean. And good playwrights know that. But he basically says to her, if you keep this up, your son is going to have you in the insane asylum, you know, faster than you can say Jack Rabbit. Is this the way you want it to be, is what he says to her. And that line, very good actor, he let it stand on its own. And in that moment, he offers her, he kind of gets it across to her that she actually has a choice. Is this the way you want it to be? And that's something that she can answer. He hasn't said, you know, you're losing your mind because you think you're a bad person or anything like this. He just holds out the possibility. When Christ, in the parable of um, the sick man that he heals, I can't remember if he was a leper. I don't, I can't remember. But the man was incredibly sick and dying. And Christ heals the man. He says to him, your sins are forgiven. He understood the, psycho the psychic basis for the illness. Shame. You know, unbearable shame. He says, your sins are forgiven. Take up your pallet and walk. So Hoke says, is this the way you want it to be? And she recognizes that there's one more chance that she has to live her life. The, the character wants to find her new life. Her husband has died. She's in this moment where she's recognizing her mortality at the beginning of the play. And she's hanging on to life, and she needs to find what her new life is. The reason why it's such a great play with a capital G, this is us every morning when we arise out of our beds. Can we say to ourselves, to what degree can we say to ourselves, your sins are forgiven, take up your pallet and walk. The past is in the past. That's why they call it the past. Those thoughts, those ideas we have about ourselves, those definitions we have of having wrecked our lives or whatever, we're animating them again, you know, like Frankenstein and making them walk and talk again. <coughs> the moment lies there open, fresh, new. She has a second chance. Peter. The great disciple Peter, who betrayed Christ far more than three times, believe me, but betrayed him as he was being crucified three times. He was never abandoned. Christ comes to him later and refers to him as Simon Peter, my rock. My rock never abandons him. In any given moment, it might as well be the only moment. A second chance is the only chance. Right? It's the first chance. Now, right? And Daisy sees it. And out of the tremendous force of Hoke's love and her undiscovered love for him that arises in that moment, she reaches out to him and says, Hoke, you are my best friend. And he says, no. And she says, yes, you are. You are. It's a great, great moment. 
she represented power. And now it flips over into grace. Because power, I mean, we all know this through our myths, through our stories. We know where power ends up. <laughs> it kind of ends up in the trash heap always. Because the only reason to want power is because you're afraid. The only reason to build all those fortifications, those walled towns in the Middle Ages, you know, 60 feet deep and whatever, some of the marvels of architecture at the time, was because you were just constantly terrified someone was coming after you. Psychologically, we live there a lot, don't we? I mean, you pick up the morning paper and you're there. You're right there. When it gets dark at night, you're there. When you lose a loved one, you're there. When something just apparently random happens to you that's really upsetting, that just turns everything upside down, just the day was going well, and then suddenly there was a phone call, whatever, you're frightened. You're frightened. So we are continually longing for power, power of some kind. Get the money in the bank. Play the market. Whatever it is. You know, our health. Yoga. <laughs> Vitamins. I have three juicers. <laughs> <laughs> and a blender. <coughs> you know, I have to, I was standing in the kitchen the other day, I started laughing. I thought, this is, this is really crazy. <laughs> This is the fear of my own death right here in my kitchen <laughs> every morning, you know. What do I think, you know, they're going to extract something more <laughs> than the last one, and that's going to do the trick. <laughs> that's going to be the preventative, you know. There's no active <coughs> ingredient in the juicer any more than there is in the aspirin. Or it would work for everyone all the time. These are illusions that we suffer. <coughs> There's no active ingredient in the aspirin, or the aspirin would work for everyone all the time. You know, you could argue that we should get half our money back. <laughs> you know, because half of the time it doesn't cure the headache, and then you reach for the five other bottles you've got that are cleaning <coughs> the same thing. The world is not working that way. It's working through grace. If you take care of other people's bodies, according to Lord Buddha, your body will be taken care of. Things will be a springboard for your health. You can take a jelly bean and your headache will go away. You cannot take anything and your headache goes away. Sometimes that happens. Why? We don't ask ourselves these things. We've gone to sleep on these questions a long time ago, probably when we were young, driving our parents crazy with them. Why does the headache go away sometimes? And other times we need to take three aspirin, five Excedrin, you know, or go get a prescription. What is it? These are really good questions. We have to really think about it. In the spiritual realm, according to Buddha, if you take care of other people's bodies, the karma of that is good health in you. In you. That's interesting. Then you can go ahead and buy the aspirin, and it will work. But don't fool yourself. There's still no active ingredient. They say because things are empty of having a self-nature, that means an independent nature. The nature of healing, let's say. The aspirin bottle contains the nature of healing. And Buddha would say everything requires your participation. That what you see is determined by how you have been. Because what you are is who you think you were. They say karma, a, a certain definition of karma, is who you think you were. That makes sense, doesn't it? That who we think we were adds up to something that we walk around as. 
we're not free of who we think we were. And if who we think we were is a kind of crummy story, we could say that's not healthy for us, psychologically, mentally, or physically. It's not wonderfully healthy to walk around feeling that we were sick, that we are sick. Right? So, one aspect of grace is to look at your past, to look at how you are defining yourself according to your past, and to ask yourself, have I wrecked my life? What is, what is the, quote, life? What is the story that I think that I ought to have fulfilled, that I didn't fulfill? There are many things that we've chosen to be. I can tell you I've spent my life being all kinds of people. And they didn't come from the playwrights. They're all inside me, or I couldn't play them. I don't play characters. There's no such thing. You can't be somebody else. It's me choosing certain aspects of myself and putting myself through a ritual with those aspects of myself. I needed to learn about grace and power. So I was able to perform that play well because that was really meaningful to me, to learn about grace and power. It resonated for me, and when it resonates for you, it resonates for other people because it's palpable. When something means something to you, it's palpable. Because we're all human, and these are big things that mean something to all of us. Grace and power mean something to all of us. So we share that. But people who are looking for the kind of power that we have in our culture that's just plastered all over everything. I've, I've said this in other teachings that I've done. I walked by a store in New York, a shoe store, and all the shoes in the window were silver. It wasn't even holiday time or anything. It was just, they were all silver. And across the front of the store in big letters were the power of platinum. <laughs> you know, I thought, this is somewhat what happens in advertising that a buzzword starts to spread in the culture, the word power. It's everywhere. They sell everything with the word power. That this person th ha it cannot have any idea what that means. It's meaningless, the power of platinum in, in, in a shoe store window. What, what, what I'm trying to think as I'm standing there is the power of platinum. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it would be more meaningful to say the power of shoes. <laughs> I think shoes <laughs> might be more meaningful. <laughs> Can't go anywhere without shoes. <laughs> you know? But it becomes so, um, we're, we become so attached to that. We're hanging our hats on it. Maybe they'll buy more shoes if I say this. It becomes ridiculous. Voltaire, one of my favorite philosophers of all time, he said, I prayed to God to make my enemies ridiculous. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> This is a man who's happy. <laughs> you know, this person prayed to God to make their advertising ridiculous, you know, and they did. <laughs> Power is constantly quantifying itself. You have to have power over something. You can't just have power. There's nothing that, it, that power could attach itself to. Power is something that functions. Powerful is not a state of being. I can't tell an actor, come on up here in a chair and be powerful. They're just going to start to laugh. I can get up here and tell an actor to be loving. That's doable. Power it, powerful is not doable. That's one of the problems with it. You have to have power over somebody. So power is just a kind of more socially acceptable word or exciting word 
than superiority. You know? Nose in the air, in. <coughs> and anything that you do that requires having power over someone is basically enslaving someone. It's enslaving someone. Because if we aren't equals, <laughs> if, if, if our <coughs> holiness himself, the Dalai Lama, says that we are all the same, if we don't see each other as equals, we have a problem, Houston. We have a big problem. All those difficulties that we live with every day, those nightmares we have at night, those anxieties that we have, those fears that we have, those <coughs> descriptions of ourselves as people who haven't lived up to the standard that we would like to see ourselves living up to, we share that with everybody else on the planet. We're all doing that. We're all scared. We live on this earth not knowing what is going to happen next and not knowing when we're going to die. That's tough. It's a tough situation to be in. And we're all in it together. One of my teachers uh, told a story to us once that the very first plane ride he ever took, he was 19, as they were about to, la to land, um, he noticed a stewardess, who that dates me, a flight attendant, forgive me, <laughs> coming, down the <laughs> coming down the aisle crying. And people started to look up front and the pilot came on the loudspeaker and said, <coughs> our landing gear won't descend. We're going to fly until our fuel is almost out and we're going to do a crash landing. <coughs> Everybody, um, this is how you need to sit. You need to bend over, put your head between your legs, remove all your jewelry, including your wedding rings, because um, they could burn through your fingers. Um, we will do our best. Everybody on the ground is alerted. You know, God help us all. And in those few minutes when they were allowing the fuel to be spent. He said the feeling that came over the plane was nothing like he'd ever experienced before or since. This outpouring of love, people making promises to each other, if you survive, would you call my wife, here's her number, would you tell my children that I love, you know. <laughs> I can't even imagine. They landed. They made it, they scrambled for their luggage, they went home, and the world reasserted itself. Wow. But this teacher said that he has never forgotten that that possibility is always there in any given moment, in any given situation. That's grace. That's grace. Mm. The story of Daisy and Hoke is the story of one person, probably on some level two, but certainly one person in this play, singled out, who does not appreciate the sacredness of something that appears like other, something that is different. This is a big problem for all of us. We all appear other to ourselves. Because you came in in a particular circumstance, in a particular family, with a particular education, in a particular culture, speaking a particular language, with all the likes and dislikes that you have and the prejudices and the glorifications of things that your family had, etc., your ancestry. There's nobody like you. So from a certain point of view, we experience the world as coming at us against us or unfamiliar with us or not family, not recognizable. 
that has to go. That has to change. From another point of view, the world is created by us because we have a particular vision. We have particular glasses on. And there couldn't be a world out there that's a standard issue world, like a movie set, that we all kind of walk onto and experience in different ways and interpret in different ways because who would let us know what that was? Who's the objective mind anywhere that would say, well, this is actually what you all were experiencing and you're wrong and you're a little closer? It's ridiculous. We, we, that, that couldn't happen anywhere. We are living in a world according to us. But if everyone is doing that from a certain point of view, then we are all the same. And we could be a gift to each other. We could be nothing but a gift to each other. Do you understand? In the way that you come to Christmas and you go, oh, I wonder what she got for me and I wonder what he got for me. And Right? That could be so amazing. But we'd have to wake up in the morning and allow for something fresh to come in. <laughs> Even with the people that we think we know the best. Because what are we knowing? They're not the movie set either. Nobody wants to be the same, really. Everybody wants a little excitement, a little adventure in life, yeah? Nobody just wants it to be the same. We, we, we have words for that. That's drudgery. That's boredom. That's, you know, why do we take vacations to Patagonia and go climb things and jump off bridges on bungee cords and, you know, why? To shake it up a little, to get out of the office, you know? To see a new day, to experience some aspect of ourselves. That's why I act to experience an aspect of myself that I might not really be that familiar with. That's why it's vulnerable making, because I may not be in total control of it. So I need a director, and other people around me, for me to say, is this okay, is this okay? I, I, it, say it's, we're like, we're like a <coughs> child, you know, standing on the diving board going, Mommy, watch, watch. You watching? You watching? Mommy, you watching? You watching? You watching? We say that like 50 times. And then they jump in, <coughs> you know, and they're coming up and you're totally prepared saying, that was absolutely great. That was wonderful. And they're going, no, 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 that wasn't it. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. <laughs> and then they go and they jump again. <laughs> right? I think that's us. That wasn't it. That wasn't it. <laughs> you know, there's more. I know there's more. Right? There's more that I can do. There's more that I can be. But keep an eye on me, because if I take a risk, <laughs> I'd like to be held. <laughs> Don't let me disappear. Don't let me disappear. Mm. You know, every, every enlightened being, it seems to me, in the stories that I've read, has gone off for 40 years in the wilderness, or something like that, right? Don't they all, they go on a walkabout? It's not just a desert, right? It's a way of being. It's a way of being that they're discovering, that they're finding there, that they're establishing. It's a, it's a place that demands being open to the flow of life around you. A place that demands being honest with yourself without regards to the cost in personal anxiety. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because we cling to these identities that we have, even if they're painful, if, if they are painful and we know it and we're, tr we're trying to move towards opening them up, breaking them up a little bit, trying to take another step towards opening our hearts, it's going to cost us for a moment in personal anxiety. Hang in there, breathe, you know, join a sangha, 
be with like-minded people, stay close to your friends, you know, ask for help, human mm -hmm. warmth around you. We, we're all trying to do this. A place that demands mm -hmm. being present with all of yourself, all of your stories about who you have been and not been. In the wilderness, your possessions cannot surround you. Your preconceptions cannot protect you. Your logic cannot promise you the future. Your guilt can no longer place you safely in the past. I think that the opposite of guilt is not humility. I think the opposite of, I mean, the opposite of power is not humility. The opposite of power is guilt. I think the opposite of power is guilt. When you're powerful, when you're feeling powerful, and you're acting powerfully, and you're feeling in power, and you're having power over others, you don't worry about guilt. <coughs> when you get off that high horse, it pretty much overwhelms you to the point where that's all you are. And that's why Miss Daisy was losing her mind. There was no part of her that she could find other than the little school teacher so long ago that was free from that guilt at all. And Hoke, with his great love and his never abandoning her, never giving up on her, just reached in and pulled her out. Your guilt can no longer place you safely in the past. You're left alone each day with an immediacy that astonishes chastens and exults. <laughs> you see the world as it is for the first time. This is written by Lawrence Kushner in a book called Honey from the Rock. Great rabbi. Mm. Mm. We need to reclaim a sense of sacred about the other. Whatever is different even if the difference seems disturbing or upsetting. It's disturbing and upsetting because it's different. There's a teaching that is beautiful in Buddhism, the five Buddha families, where they take aspects, five aspects of Buddhahood, basically, five aspects of enlightenment. And they look at them from the, from the aspect of neurosis. Each of these enlightened aspects has its flip side of neurosis, like those dolls, you know, like r riding it is on this side, and you flip her skirt under, and there's the wolf, you know. <laughs> Just like that. It's so comforting to me that, for instance, the enlightened quality of clarity, total clarity, is the flip side of anger. Because when you're angry, really angry, aren't you totally clear that you're right? Isn't that a tremendous clarity that you have? You're so justified. You just let somebody have it. So in this play, Driving Miss Daisy, we have this cranky old lady, angry at the world for putting her in the place that she is, and she flips over into tremendous clarity. She gains, by the end of the play, the enlightened quality of clarity. Every neurotic aspect has an enlightened aspect inside it. Meaning that if we are fully human, we can get there. If we stop disowning the neurotic aspects of our lives. If we stop condemning ourselves, truly, charity begins at home. We have to, we have to begin to soften. Soften around ourselves and then be friendly with others and see the sacredness, these divine qualities, in both. This is why an enlightened being spends time in the wilderness. This is why we meditate and get quiet and go off for part of the day. 
you have to you have to be able to see the world again as it is and get out from under the stories get out from under the fray for a while quiet down breathe check in with yourself let the race of the thoughts go by don't keep grabbing on to every you know taxi cab there don't keep hailing cabs in your mind let it go through and see what's beyond that what's underneath that Pema Chodron says the most beautiful thing. She says, underneath anger is sadness. Underneath the sadness is the clear blue sky. That's an extraordinary thing to say. And she's not talking about you are you know, becoming a being of light at that point. She's talking about a human being can experience that spaciousness, that openness. That, that's forgiveness. The clear blue sky. That's forgiveness. Mm. It's a wonderful story um, that a man named Parker Palmer, who was a um, real revolutionary in the field of education, um, he tells this story of a place called the Allen School in Dayton, Ohio. It was a school that was failing terribly on every level. For many of the years, it, it hit the bottom of the list in that city by every measure that they can make of a school. There were fifth graders who had parole officers. The dropout rate was incredible. The failure of those students in every aspect of their lives just made you sick. And along came a new principal a principal from the Philippines, a culture that has an inherent respect for things spiritual in a way that the American culture does not necessarily have, and certainly has removed from the field of education. And he brought the teachers together and he said to them in substance, as his very first proclamation as principal, we have to start to understand that the young people we're working with have no external support they have dangerous <coughs> neighborhoods, they have poor places to live, they don't have enough food, they have parents who are on the ropes, barely able to pay attention to them, and the externals with which the American education system is obsessed will not work in this situation. But these students have one thing that no one else can take away from them. They have their souls. And from this day forth, in this school, we're going to lift those souls up. We're going to make those souls visible to the young people themselves and to their parents and to the community. We're going to celebrate those souls and we're going to reground their lives in the power of those souls. And that will require that the faculty recover the power of their own souls. <laughs> Remembering, too, that we are soul-driven, meaning that every day we're asking the biggest questions in life. What the hell are we doing here? That's what he means by your soul, just the center of you that is always asked, why are we doing this math? Why are we studying the Egyptians? You know? Why are we, why are we doing physics? What, 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 why are we doing chemistry, mom? Right? These questions are good questions. <laughs> I had a teacher who said to me when I was very young, to be a better citizen, and, and I thought that meant kind of like to be a civil servant. I, my picture was I'd have a uniform and I'd help people across the street. <laughs> I didn't know what a citizen meant at the time. <laughs> and in a way, that it, it's kind of apt, I think, that understanding of it. Mm. Soul animated creatures, he called everybody in that school. And in a five year period, that school, the Allen School, rose to the top of every dimension on which it had been at the bottom. Hard work, discipline, attentiveness to the inward factors that we are here to explore. Not romanticism, the real world. 
the soul, <coughs> he said, is like a wild animal, tough, self-sufficient, resilient, but also exceedingly shy. He said, let us remember, and so this is true of all relationship, that if we go crashing through the woods, screaming and yelling for the soul to come out, it will evade us night and day. It, we cannot beat the bushes and yell at each other if we expect this precious inwardness to emerge. But if you are willing to go into the woods and sit quietly at the base of a tree, that wild animal will, after a few hours, reveal itself to you. And out of the corner of your eye, you will glimpse something of the wild preciousness that you are looking for. So magnificent. So, you know, the system of competition, the system of winning, constantly winning in this country, our athletics, these people are being paid millions of dollars, they're professionals, and they will leave the field without shaking hands with each other. What are we doing? It, on national television, international television. What are we representing to people? What does that mean? Right? You know, we talked um, at the last teaching I gave on peace, about unity, that there's a wholeness if you are at peace. That means there is no other, you and other, all are the same, all are one thing. There's no strife, there's no struggle. And even though we often paint spirituality as the struggle between good and evil, you know, at the top, there is no struggle between good and evil. There's no struggle at all. Because that duality belongs to us. And they say when you become a Buddha, they won't call you by your name. You won't be thinking the way we're thinking now. Our relatedness is precious. They say in the teachings of Lojong called uh, heart training, training in the warm heart, training to, to, to gain a warm heart, that another person, especially a person that is really bothering you or that's really difficult in your life, is more precious than a wish-giving gem. And they say that's true because we're so ignorant, we wouldn't know what to wish for. We'd wish for something that would just give us more problems. You know, money, <laughs> some big fat car, I don't know, something that we think external to us would make us happy. But they say if you can see the person that you're having the hardest time with as your highest teacher, see, someone that you lose your patience with all the time and you hate them for it, right, they're your highest teacher of patience. And you buddy up with them, you know, shake. And you say, okay, partner, you and me, we're going to get me to enlightenment. And you just be as upsetting as you like. You just falsely accuse me all you want. And you know what, bud, I'm going to be, I'm going to hold my seat. I'm just going to be patient and gentle and kind and when I get there, I'm going to give you half the credit. <laughs> See, we, there's no way we can rise without other people. How would we practice, how would we learn how to love unless there is someone to love? In order to have power, you must have power over someone because it functions. In order to be loving, you have to love. In order for us to learn how to love, there has to be someone that we can't love. 
because then we'll know what our limitations are. Where's the boundary? Where do we get stuck? You know, they say, Mark is asleep. <laughs> so sweet. So sweet. <laughs> We're not going to wake up. Perhaps he's having a beautiful dream. So <laughs> it's how I feel about people in the front row who fall asleep when I'm doing a play. <laughs> bless you, bless you, we have a sweet dream. Did you hear it on the audio? You could hear when he missed on the audio. Absolutely. Absolutely. More power to <laughs> mm. Power only separates you. It can only isolate you. It can only result in loneliness. You know, um, Lama Marut has written a wonderful new book about becoming nobody. And he makes the point that we're so anxious about being valued that we're running around trying to be more and more and more special. So special. Trying to be somebody. But it can only result in loneliness. Because the way to have something is to give it away. You can't have, have something if you're constantly clinging to it, guarding it, worrying about how it is, not letting anything happen to it. That's just... Terror, that's just pure terror. That's not the sense of ownership. You only have something if you're willing to give it away. Power, give it away. You know, Christ entered Jerusalem on a donkey. The symbolism at that time was Christ was a political animal. <coughs> Gandhi was a political animal and so was Martin Luther King. They didn't stay out of politics, they entered the world. It was a horse that you would ride in on if you were a king. Your war horse, your symbol of power. The donkey was a symbol of peace. So the irony, arriving at the gates of Jerusalem as the king of the Jews on the donkey, was he gave over his power. And from the moment he entered the city, he gave over his power with everything that he did until they crucified him. They asked him to speak for himself, he was silent. They told him to carry his cross, he bore it. <coughs> they whipped him, he didn't say a thing. And he died. And he died. But he knew what he was dying for. When you let something go, an aspect of power, it's going to feel like that, like something is dying. And it's frightening. But in the spiritual realm, it's, things are paradoxical, they're upside down. To lose your life, you save your life. To save your life, you lose your life. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Try it. <laughs> I don't mean go out and kill yourself. Right? <laughs> Try understanding the paradox. The person in the office that's always doing for others you know, that's always staying late, that's always the last to close up, the humble one, the quiet one. Doesn't everybody in the office at some point, don't they almost feel compelled to say, let's all pool our money and send so-and-so on a great vacation. Let's send her off on a weekend, blah, 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 blah. Right? By virtue of who that person is, everyone's hearts just come towards them to take care of them, to help them. Right? You will not be abandoned. You will not be abandoned. When you're really concerned that you don't have any power, move toward grace. Grace means inclusion, intimacy, the recognition of the sacred in the other, our sameness. Right? The sense that if everything is changing three trillion times a second, what is so threatenable? You know? If everything is moving here, if I'm a stream, what, what is somebody going to do? I'll be halfway down the hill before they even <laughs> get to me. We have to begin to have a sense of ourselves as something that's flowing, that's flowing. 
love flows. Right? That state of being is something that gives, receives, gives again, receives, gives again, receives. Currency, that's true currency. Right? I think we should take a break. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That's good. Let's take a break. Oh, it's some trouble. Oh, no, 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 no